we are going to be starting our study of the book of Psalms today. Uh, if you would like to uh, turn there, uh, and we are going to just be doing an overview study of the Psalter. Uh, it is 150 Psalms, so at the rate that I go uh, expositionally, uh, I will probably be 180 years old by the time we finish. So um, basically the game plan is uh, not to cover every single Psalm, because many of them are similar. Uh, but we'll cover a, a number of them over uh, the next uh, year, uh, and uh, should be a great time in the Word of God. So uh, just pray uh, for God's blessings on us as we uh, open this uh, worship and prayer guide uh, from the saints of the Old Testament. So let's do that this morning. God, we uh, pause uh, together before your throne. Uh, how awesome it must be to see you face to face, to stand in your presence, um, to hear the saints sing and worship you, uh, 24-7, to hear the angelic voices uh, saying how holy you are and joining in with the song of the saints, uh, how magnificent it must be to be in your presence. We pray for just a small taste of that as we begin our study of the Psalter today, and may you anoint this study, use it greatly in our lives to deepen us in our worship of you. May it teach us how to pray, how to praise, and do all the things that we're called to do as maturing saints and we just pray that the, the uh, understanding of your character uh, that will be on display throughout this great book may radically change us into your image. And we pray for those uh, uh, who uh, don't know you, uh, that listen to these studies, uh, pray that in a powerful way you would uh, plant the seed of the gospel and the joy of knowing Christ in their hearts. And we just pray for ourselves just in light of all the things that are going on in our world that you continue to encourage us, uplift lift us, uh, give us uh, wisdom and joy for living, uh, and may our, our countenance be that which gives hope uh, and uh, great joy to those that come in contact with us, because we have the hope of Christ. Thank you for your presence today, and pray your anointing on the study. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, certainly caught everybody by surprise. Who would have ever thought that something like this would happen in your lifetime? Uh, I've read and studied it over the years as being something that could potentially happen, but I never thought along with you that something like this could occur. Um, but I mean, we've all read about the Spanish flu in 1918, smallpox, um, which killed uh, many Native Americans, polio, uh, which peaked in 1955, not long before I was born. Uh, we've heard of uh, Ebola, SARS, I mean, all the different pestilences and plagues that have hit the earth. We are familiar with them. Uh, and basically, it was only a matter of time, I'm sure, before one actually became uh, the pandemic that this is today that we are experiencing in our lifetime. The other day, I was uh, doing a little reading uh, about uh, plagues, and I came across an article from uh, 2009 uh, from the Institute of Medicine for a Forum of uh, Microbial Threats, is the title of the, of the company that produced this. Uh, and in this particular article uh, is called Microbial Evolution and Co-Adaptation. Uh, it was a very interesting read, uh, something completely out of my field, but to stretch your thinking, sometimes you must do that. Second chapter was most interesting. Uh, Woolhouse and Gaunt from the University of Edinburgh uh, painstakingly identified uh, as scientists 1,400 human uh, pathogen species, and of those, they said 500 are capable of human-to-human -human, uh, disease transmission, uh, and uh, of those, they said there's a 150 have the potential to become uh, uh, pandemics, 150 of them. And so they uh, say in their paper in chapter 2, written back in 2009, as I said, that we should uh, prepare for three of these kind of uh, uh, episodes to occur per year. That Per year, that's what I said. Uh, when I read that, I was like, you've got to be kidding, uh, per year? Uh, so God has been most gracious to us because I don't think we've experienced anything to this magnitude per year. Uh, but we all understand how a pandemic uh, completely upends your life uh, from the beginning to the end of, the, of your day. Um, it is uh, something that is most disconcerting just from a human perspective, very unnerving. With one pandemic, uh, your basic uh, constitutional rights are kind of put on hold, and I'm kind of watching what's going on the, around the country, wondering if some of those uh, constitutional rights are going to come back. Um, uh, you, you can't be with as many people as you want to be with anymore because of all stated reasons. Uh, and I personally, I don't know about you, but I, I miss being together with the church. I think that's the thing I miss the most 
is being together with you as the body of Christ. Um, I miss that. I'm looking forward to that. But, but now that's a distant memory until the governor lifts the ban on the, on the conditions today. But uh, you live in Zoom meetings. I, I am in Zoom meetings all week. I didn't even really know what Zoom meetings were until this hit. Uh, now I'm in them all the time, and I know a lot about how to set one up. And uh, I bought a Zoom account so I can have longer meetings. But all of a sudden, I'm at the point where I'm sure many of you are, where you just want to sit down and have a meeting with people face to face. I mean, who would have ever thought you'd get to that point? Um, it's awkward to talk to people when you're out in public. I always like to banter and talk when, uh, you know, if you're standing in the line at the post office, you're six feet apart from the person in, near you, and they got a mask on, you've got a mask on. You can't read their mouth to see if they're smiling or frowning, and it, it's just, everything's just hard. It's very hard. And so um, it's, just a, it's just a difficult time. It's a frustrating time uh, when you go out shopping for the basic necessities that you need. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. Uh, and you go from store to store to try to find just the basic things. Uh, and it's just, it's just hard. So it has changed everything, this pandemic, in many ways. Uh, it has uh, caused much fear, caused much frustration. Uh, people are afraid of uh, death. They're afraid of disease. Uh, they're afraid of losing uh, retirement income. I'm afraid of a lot of things, and I, I felt sorry for the, the surfer that I watched the other day out of California, my home state. Uh, the poor guy is out in the ocean all by himself on his surfboard trying to get a little exercise in, in R&R, uh, and he had a, uh, I think it was two boats uh, came alongside of him and arrested him for his behavior. Um, sh it was absolutely shocking to me, uh, but, uh, you know, they didn't want him breaking the, the rules uh, and going and doing something like that. It's just it's an illogical time. Uh, you can, you can uh, go to church in some places and sit in your car uh, and, and listen to the service on FM radio, uh, and then you get a $500 fine for doing so. Un unbelievable. But then uh, the liquor stores open for business, and uh, anybody can come and go as they please. So I listen to these things, and it's just, it's just incongruous to me how it all plays out. You know, when you encounter deep waters like this, and indeed they are deep waters, as a Christian— uh, at least to several questions. Uh, my first question as a Christian is, how, how am I supposed to live to God's glory in this type of pandemic? How am I supposed to do that? Especially when you're cut off from people and you can't get out of the house very much. And how, how am I supposed to live to God's glory? And it leads to a, a, a second uh, question, is how can you gain mental and spiritual strength uh, at times of great fear? Uh, for me, personally, that's, that's why I've, decided to zero in on the, the psalms of, of uh, the scriptures because uh, it answers those questions. Um, it, uh, it teaches us, uh, number one, uh, the psalms, the main purpose of psalms is to teach us as God's people uh, how to worship God. That's what the psalms are about, how the believer in an individual way uh, is to approach God and worship God, most important thing for us to do. Um, it also teaches us how to pray to him, uh, how, to, how to praise him. Uh, when you read through a lot of the Psalms, you see the heart of the psalmist on the paper, and you can identify with them. They're highly emotional, but they, they teach us how to, how to approach God when times are tough, and also how to approach God when times are, are great. Charles uh, Spurgeon, the famous uh, uh, pastor in England from the 1800s, uh, said that the Psalms were his favorite part of Scripture. Uh, he has what is called the Treasury of David. I own, own them, uh, in fact, I own all of the uh, sermons of, of Spurgeon, but, uh, which is multi-volumes, but there's two fat volumes, thick, uh, of his analysis, his sermons from the Psalms, his favorite book, uh, The Treasury David. I would submit it to you to purchase. Uh, Alexander McLaren, another great pastor from the 1800s, uh, great uh, expositor of the word, loved the Psalms, uh, and this is what he said about the Psalms. He says, if the rest of Scripture may be called the Spirit of God to man... This book of Psalms is the answer of the Spirit of God in man. Translated, uh, he's basically saying the Old Testament is telling uh, you uh, how God thinks about things from his perspective down to us, but the Psalter is us as God's people reaching up to him and asking him for help and assistance, etc. Uh, such is the order of the day. I can think of nothing better for us to study than the Psalter uh, as we look at a, a pandemic because it answers so many of the fundamental questions of how to how to how to live for God's glory, how to, how to give him praise in tough times like this. So what I want to do 
uh, is, is go through a, a foundational uh, study of the Psalms, an introductory study, uh, asking uh, foundational questions that may be old hat to you if you've known Christ for a long time, maybe uh, information you forgot, or maybe it's a new information that you need to know uh, that will serve as a great foundation from which we can build the superstructure of our study of the Psalter. Um, and so I would submit to you, you might want to start reading the Psalms. It doesn't take a long time to read them, even though there's 150 chapters. Uh, I get up early in the morning uh, every day. Uh, they're on my iPad. I sit with a cup of coffee before people are up in my house, and I just start reading, you know, a whole bunch of them, one after the other, to feed the soul. So I'd submit to you to do that. Uh, the Psalms uh, in Hebrew, is, uh, it is called Sefer Tef- Te- Tehillim, Sefer Tehillim, which means uh, a book of praises. Uh, that is not the name given to the, the Psalter in our English translations. Our English translations come from the Greek Septuagint, uh, which is psalmoi, which means poems that are sung with musical accompaniment. Uh, but the original Hebrew, Sefer Tehillim, uh, encompasses really what the Psalms are all about. Uh, they cover a wide variety of topics, but they are a book of praises from the beginning to the end. Uh, and the way they're structured, Psalm chapter 1 is a wisdom psalm about how to be a wise person and follow hard after God. But they build to a crescendo uh, in the praise of God with Psalm 150 is an amazing way to go out. It's like a beautiful uh, piano masterpiece that you're building to the crescendo. Uh, the great uh, revelation of the essence of the song is at the end. Uh, that's the way the Psalter is put together. It's a, a book of praise. But we want to look at some foundational questions as we approach our study of the Psalter. And I'll begin uh, studying Psalm 1 next week if you would like to read ahead. Um, first question we want to answer is, uh, what is the structure of the Old Testament? What is the structure of the Old Testament? Uh, if you're an older Christian, this should be something that you could uh, sit down and tell me quickly. If you're a new Christian, you might not have a clue. Uh, so it's good to start with just the basic structure of the Old Testament. And how many books are there in the Old Testament? Uh, there are 39 books. And as I've told you before, I'll tell you again, the way that you know there's 39 books is you look at the letters of Old and Testament. There's three letters for Old, nine letters for Testament, Three and nine is 39, 39 books. Um, so let's look at the structure with this uh, chart that I put together when I teach the Old Testament introduction. Uh, you might, might have seen this before. It's quite helpful. Shows you the structure is put together in a very particular way by God. It's not by accident. So when you look at the, the chart, you see that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the books of law, there are five of them. So this is God telling us how we got here, how we fell into sin, that he's going to send the Messiah, that he's going to choose a, a chosen people. This is God reaching down to us and, and, and coming for us. That book of Exodus, uh, where we should worship God. Leviticus, how we should approach God with sacrifice. Those are the first five books of the law. Uh, those are balanced by five poetical books in the center. So they're, they're like the heart of the Old Testament. They're pivotal. Um, those are then balanced on the other side by prophetical books, major prophets. There's five of those. Uh, and the difference between a major and a minor prophet is just the length of the book. So, case in point, Isaiah, 66 chapters, um, is called a major prophet because of its length. Something like Obadiah is, is a minor prophet because it's just one chapter. But So there's five books of the law, five, five books of a poetry, uh, and five books of major prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. That's balanced by uh, historical books. There's nine of them. Uh, that were written before the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. Then there's nine prophetical books uh, of minor prophets written after the Babylonian uh, captivities uh, where, where God then comes along and says, let me explain to you through the word of the prophet wh- what's going on with my kingdom program. I haven't forgotten what I'm doing in the world even though there's many upheavals. And that's the thing to pay attention to. Even though there's pandemics and terrible things that happen, God's hand is always on the wheel guiding human history to the coming of the Messiah. And then lastly, the Old Testament closes closes out with uh, three historical books that were written after the Babylonian captivity, and then three books that are prophetical written after the Babylonian captivity, where God again wants to reassure us that his kingdom program hasn't been thwarted. It's quite uh, on track. But at the center of this is what we want to focus on. At the heart of the Old Testament are the five prophetical books. Uh, So those 39 books of the Old Testament were written over 1,200 years by over 30 authors 
on a variety of subjects, some of them quite volatile in nature, but they all are in unison as to what they are speaking about because the Spirit of God is weaving His truth through all those books like a beautiful thread. But when you get to the, the poetry books, uh, God is going to move from narrative literature to poetical literature to, to speak to us in a new way. And he begins this with the book of Job, which is the oldest book of the Old Testament, the book of Job. And we all know the troubles that Job endured. Uh, and that, that particular book about the troubles he faced uh, as God, God allowed the devil to rock his world, uh, a lot of things that, saw, that Job faced are answered in the Psalms, which logically follows. Like, where is God when I suffer? Uh, well, the Psalms gives the answer where God is. Uh, does God care that I'm in deep trouble? Well, the Psalter will tell you, yes, let me answer that for you. Uh, Job, I'm sure, asked the question, how do I live a godly life surrounded by godless people? Well, the Psalter will answer that question. Or how do I pray when there's great pain in my life? Well, the, the Psalter will answer that question. See, the, the Psalms are an awesome study for people in difficult times, uh, and they have the answers at the core of the Old Testament of what we need to know. Who wrote the book is the next thing we want to look at. The authorship of the particular book can help us understand something about the book we're going to study. Uh, various authors wrote the book of Psalms over a period of 980 years. So Moses wrote one of the Psalms. If you figure Moses was around uh, uh, on the planet around in his height of his ministry about 1410 BC, uh, and these particular books, the Psalms, were probably assembled uh, in, in their current format by Ezra the scribe, is what scholars believe. Ezra the scribe was around 430 BC. That's how you get to the fact that this uh, compilation of Psalms uh, was, was put together over a period of almost a thousand years. It's unbelievable. There's many facets of these Psalms that we can identify with. Uh, some are highly emotional. Uh, some are uh, recording the spiritual and up, ups and downs of a saint. Uh, some of them are highly ecstatic and full of great joy as people praise God. Uh, there's about every kind of emotion that a Christian could, could find here, which is why they're so great to study at a time like this. David, Israel's most decorated warrior uh, and most famous and beloved king, he wrote 73 of the Psalms. And I won't list them all for you. They're in my notes. You can read online tomorrow. But uh, da David wrote uh, 73 of the Psalms. Uh, and from Acts chapter 4, verse 25, and Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 7, we learn that David also wrote Psalm 2, the great messianic psalm about the coming of the Jesus, the Messiah, and also Psalm 95. So David wrote a big chunk of the Psalms, which I find this is interesting. A man known as Israel's warrior, steeped in hand-to-hand -hand combat, who had seen his share of battle, uh, who had been surrounded by death and mayhem, here is a man who wrote, uh, almost half of these great psalms to God. Why? Well, he had a heart for God. He was a humble man. He was a broken man. He was a, a man, as you can see in the Psalter, as he writes, who was constantly thinking about his walk with God. And as he writes his psalms, you can see his emotion all over the pages. He pours his heart out to God. David, it's such a great man of God. And I would say, given a church in the D.C. area where a lot of our people uh, have been to Annapolis, or the, the Air Force Academy, uh, the Coast Guard Academy, uh, West Point, wherever you've been, we, had a lot, we have a lot of Davids among us. Uh, a lot of people who've seen a lot of things in life that are terrible and difficult. But, but those are the kind of people God wants to speak to and speak through. And so you're going to be able to identify a lot with King David if that's you. God, God wants to use you and the pain you've seen and the troubles you've seen in a profound way, not to only build your life up, but to use you as he did David to touch other lives. Asaph uh, was a choir director uh, in the temple in Israel. He wrote 12 of the Psalms. Uh, Korah was a music leader, uh, and he's from the family line that was judged in Moses' day. Uh, if you go back and read uh, Numbers 16 and 17, his, uh, his family line uh, uh, was judged by God for trying to overthrow uh, biblical leadership, the leadership of Moses. It's the Korah Rebellion. Uh, and what this tells us is God takes the line of Korah that had been judged uh, with uh, God. If you go back and read Numbers 16 and 17, God sends a localized earthquake uh, and causes the ground to open up and suck in the, uh, 
the people who are trying to overthrow the God-appointed leader, Moses, closes the earth back up, that would change your mind about trying to overthrow a godly leader. That was the line. And God says in, here in the book of Psalms that his grace was still shown to that family line because years later, uh, Korah is a music leader from that judged family line that now experiences the grace of God, and he's able to, to compose 10 of the Psalms in the inspired Psalter. King Solomon, uh, that, by the way, gives us hope. Because when we go off the rails and uh, someone in our family line has done some terrible things, God's never completely done with you. He has much grace and mercy for you. Uh, King Solomon also wrote two Psalms, Psalm 72 and 127. Moses, as I said, uh, wrote uh, Psalm 90, one Psalm. Heman, uh, he's an unknown uh, Israelite, wrote one Psalm, Psalm 88. Uh, uh, and Ethan was another unknown man in Israel. Uh, he wrote uh, the great uh, Psalm 89, which is amazing. God takes an, an unknown person uh, that we don't have any clue as to who he really was. Uh, we just know his name, and he allows him to write Psalm 89. Now, that might not be significant to you, but that's highly significant because Psalm 89 is one of the greatest Davidic prophecies built into the Psalter, pointing forward to the arrival of the Messiah, the coming of his kingdom, the, the promise of the Davidic covenant, that God is going to fulfill it. He's going to be true to his word. He takes a virtual unknown person to speak forth a great known message about the coming of the kingdom of Messiah. He does it through somebody who's totally obscure, which tells you how God operates. You might be unknown, obscure, a nobody, and God looks down from heaven and says, you're, you're just the kind of person I want to use. And so he's still the same kind of God. The rest of the Psalms are anonymous. We have no idea who wrote them. Uh, and what that tells us is uh, God knows who wrote them. And, and, and God knows when you do great things in his name, you might, no one might ever know the things you've done for God. But God in heaven, we know from Matthew chapter 25, he keeps track of just the cold water you give to somebody or some deed that you do for somebody during the virus, uh, giving them a mask, or sharing, sharing food with them, or whatever it is that you do. Uh, it, those anonymous things, God keeps track of and will reward one day. So the authors of the book come from a wide uh, variety of individuals in time, down to people we don't even know, which tells you God uses anybody and everybody uh, to, to bring praise to his throne and to advance his kingdom. Another question that we want to ask in the foundational study is, what is the nature of Hebrew poetry? Now, I'm going to admit, um, I am not a lover of poetry. I mean, I know there's some people in church, they get all excited if you're going to read, uh, you know, Emily Dickinson, uh, Woodsworth, Oscar Wilde, Kipling, etc. Um, you know, I've even been in homes with uh, folks in our church before where they, they open up uh, some of this kind of reading uh, after dinner, just to kind of relax, and I'm kind of like, what are you doing? Uh, I have never really been into that kind of poetry, but somebody really get off on it and totally enjoy, um, well, poetry, like Frost, uh, nothing gold can stay. It goes like this. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so for an hour, then leaf subsides to leaf. So Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down today, nothing gold can stay. I mean, some people would be reading that thinking, oh, that's just awesome. And I, I will admit to you, it does, it does share biblical motifs that everything in this old world is transitory. It's just I personally have not been too excited about poetry uh, in my lifetime. Uh, of the thousands of books that I own, I, I w looked at them this week. I only have one poetry book, and I'm really not quite sure where it is. Um, but that, you know, with all seriousness, uh, I respect poetry, but I'm more excited about biblical poetry. I mean, biblical, because I want to understand, what, is, what does God have to say? And, and the fact that God has chosen five poetical books to speak to us is most interesting, because there's a lot of things that he says in the Psalter he could have said in a variety of ways and just given it to us straight out. But God uses poetry uh, to, to catch us off guard to get his message across to us, to come to speak to us in a vivid way that we hadn't anticipated so that we can really get into what he's wanting us to know. So what is Hebrew poetry like? Well, uh, it uses a lot of parallelism, and we'll talk about that as we study the Psalter. Uh, it uses a lot of repetition that 
what God says in one line or two lines, he might repeat in lines three and four. There's a lot of repetition. So you have to ask yourself, why does God always repeat himself? Well, if you have children, uh, you absolutely know why God repeats himself. Because uh, especially when they're at home with you 24-7 now, uh, I'm sure telling them one thing one time usually doesn't quite get it. It's that repetition to get through their skull that this is what I want you to know. So God's very patient with us through repetition. He also uses uh, figures of speech that we'll get into to, to help you understand the importance of, of, of getting at the core of what he wants to talk about. Figures of speech. This is so refreshing. Now, as I think about Hebrews, uh, he, uh, figures of speech, uh, I grew up in a home uh, that was a southern home. As I've told you before, my father was from uh, South Carolina. My mother uh, is from uh, Arkansas. And so I, I was raised in, a, in, a, in an environment where my, my father was steeped with southern sayings. And I had to kind of figure out as a young person, uh, what did he say? Like, what did he mean by that? Uh, because southern sayings are figurative in nature. Uh, and so I had to listen to my father and go, oh, this is, this is what he means. And this is a lot like Hebrew poetry. The, the author's going to say one thing in a figurative way, and then it's up to you to figure out, what did, what did he mean? He makes you think about it. So I, I learned the value of Hebrew poetry by listening to Southern Saints. I'll, I'll, I'll give a few of them to you in case you don't know them. Uh, these are kind of the things I heard growing up. Uh, he's only got one oar in the water. He's only got one oar in the water. What does that mean? Well, uh, that person from that particular statement, in my estimation, as I interpret it, is probably not all quite there mentally. Or, uh, he's grinning like a possum eating a sweet tater. Uh, okay, what's that mean? Well, uh, that means that uh, that person is really enjoying like whatever it is they're doing, probably eating something great. Uh, that's a southern saying. Here's another one. Um, his cornbread ain't done in the middle. Uh, well, that's probably saying something that this cognitively, cognitively something missing with this guy. Um, here's another one. Uh, a father could say to a son who's disobedient, uh, I'm about to jerk a knot in your tail. Well, as a child, I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I don't have a tail. Uh, but as you analyze, uh, oh, that's a southern saying. There's a, there's a cryptic meaning there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, he's as nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Okay, you see what I mean? I, I didn't need to even translate that, what that means. I grew up having to translate things that my dad was saying to me to think, what is the message? What does he mean? This is what God does uh, in the Psalter. So from Genesis to Esther, he primarily uses narrative literature to speak to us. And you can kind of get the big idea from God in narrative literature. And then when you, when you get into poetic literature, you're like, huh, that's totally different. What, what does he mean by that? So to understand the essence of figurative language, you have to study figurative language. So uh, I'm going to introduce you just to a couple of figurative uh, concepts that we will run into all over the place. Uh, and you may not know the technical name, but you're going to soon know what these are. Because to understand God's point, you have to understand what is the figure that he's using. So let's just look at a couple of them. Anthropopathia. Uh, this is where you take human characteristics and you put them on God. Case in point, Psalm 32, 8. Uh, says, I will, inst I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will count you, counsel you with my eye upon you. So you have to ask yourself as you're an interpreter studying this altar, does, does God really have eyes? Does he really have a, does he have a set of eyes like we do? Well, no, uh, because God is spirit. So he's not like us in that way. So when you take uh, our eyes and you project them onto God, that's a figure of speech called anthropopathia, where you're trying to explain the fact that that, well, God does keep his eyes on you. He does, he does watch you, he, but he has perfect eyesight as he's looking at your life. And that can morally change how you live in a given day if you truly understand his eye is upon me. It can also give you great uh, hope knowing that no matter what I face, whether it's a, a pandemic, it's a, a doctor's uh, 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 diagnosis that, that goes south on me, whatever it is that happens, his eye is on me, and the figure of speech tells me that. Anabasis is, a, is another particular uh, figure of speech. Um, and this, this one is uh, most interesting. You find it in Psalm 1, and we're going to cover this in detail next week. But anabasis uh, means, uh, it's from the Greek preposition ana, which means to uh, go up, uh, and uh, the, the, the verb binen, which means to, to go. So, to, so to, to move up, to move from one thing to another thing. 
Uh, Psalm chapter 1 uses this right from the very beginning. Uh, Psalm chapter 1, we read this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So if you are paying attention, there's a movement here from one thing to another thing. Uh, you could circle the verbs in your, in your Bible. Uh, blessed is the man who does not walk, verb one, in the, in the counsel of the wicked. The, and who does not stand, verb number two, uh, in the path of sinners. And who does not sit in the seat of scoffers, number three. What you find is through this movement from one point to another point, uh, this isn't a movement upward, this is a movement downward. And God says, a wise person doesn't do these things, but an unwise person does. And we all understand how this works, and we'll study it in detail next week. But you first start walking through life, just minding your own business, looking forward to Christ and being obedient to him, and not paying attention to what's going on around you. And then, well, then you start, you stop. You're not walking anymore. You, you stand, and you start looking around at what the godless are doing around you, the temptations that you see. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you are sitting in them and doing those sins. And what he says through Anabasis is, uh, don't be the kind of person uh, that goes from one thing to the other and then winds up in sin. A wise person doesn't live like that. We'll talk more about that next week. Metaphor. Uh, we all speak with metaphors in a given week. Uh, a metaphor is a comparison in which one thing is or represents another thing. So, case in point, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 says, all, all flesh is as grass. Um, uh, it's, it's telling you something about grass in a simile format. Uh, but, but metaphor is about whatever is stated in a metaphor, it is that particular thing. Case in point, Psalm 23, verse 1, which we all know well, uh, says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, it's telling you that the Lord is the essence of what a shepherd is. He's a one-to-one -one correspondence with that. He is a shepherd which gives us great hope in our lives that no matter what happens, he's there to care for us, to watch over us, to protect us. That's a metaphor. In a simile, uh, you're saying that one thing is explicitly resembling another thing. Uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, great prophecy about the Messiah, says this. It says, you, the Messiah, shall break them, uh, people who oppose his reign, with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Uh, he's using simile uh, to say that it, it, in the kingdom age, when people rebel against the Messiah's reign, righteousness will reign because he will see them as a clay pot, like a clay pot. It's not that the godless are the clay pot. They just resemble it in the fact that he will be as the righteous Messiah, the one who will strike their, their rebellion with a rod of iron and destroy their pot and create righteousness and peace. He won't put up with anything as, from our perspective. And he'll create peace on earth uh, by judging sin instantly, not like today where sin runs rampant. But that's a simile. Uh, there's another one that I encountered in college that I found most interesting. It's called chiasmus or chiasm. Chiasm uh, was introduced to me by Dr. John Hartley, the head of the Old Testament department at Azusa Pacific University. And I remember sitting in class one day when he was uh, showing what chiasm is, and it was like an aha moment in my mind. And then once I understood what chiasm was, I saw it everywhere when I was studying books like the Psalter. Uh, chiasm uh, has its uh, emphasis in the middle. It's uh, based on the, uh, the, the Hebrew word key, which is like a giant X. And uh, as an X has a, a middle point, that's the essence, the most important thing that author wants to state. Uh, Psalm 103, if you want to read it and study it, is an extended chiasm. Uh, I will show it to you in, in its format. Uh, in chiasm, you look for units of thought that go together. Uh, and so if you look at Psalm uh, 103, which I put together here in a chiastic format, you will find as it moves through the Psalter, when you get to point uh, 10, verse 10, uh, we would classify this as the letter E in, in the theme, which then bleeds over into verses 11 to 13, uh, which show you that the chiasm covers verses 10 through 13. And then he picks back up and he reverses what he has said in the Psalm, and D, those verses represent the D above. The C represents C above. And he gets back to point A, exhort, exhortation to bless God. But as you study that psalm at that level, this did not happen by accident. Uh, 
because when you're studying it and you understand at the core of this psalm, Psalm 103, God builds a chiasm so that the middle of that X is what he wants you to really focus on. What does he want you to focus on? Well, I'll read it to you. Verse 10. He says in one, Psalm 103, verse 10, He, God, has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. That's, isn't that comforting? Because God says, when you think about me, think about me as a compassionate father who wants the best from you as a child. Uh, and no matter what you faced in life, uh, and, and no matter what sins you have committed, if you are my child, understand that the core of my being, I am the essence of verses 10 to 13. I, I'll not deal with you according to your sin. Uh, I will show you my great loving kindness, even, even in your sin. Like a father comes alongside a child, I will come alongside you. And I tell you, on, on any given day, and any given week, uh, you can all say amen to that, that God is that kind of God. Uh, that, he, that he loves us like a father loves a child, and he wants the best for us, even when we stray. The essence of who he is is denoted by that chiasm. So if chiasm seems something totally wow that just blows my mind, it's over my head, uh, by the time we're done with Psalms in about, I don't know, what, 40 years, uh, you will know the essence of a chiasm, because it's not just a, a cool thing to understand. God built it in here for us to see it so we can appreciate just the essence of who he is, and this is the case in point for that. So I, I don't know if you're excited about the Psalms. Uh, I, I am, and I'm looking forward to God speaking to me and to you in a profound way and bringing you much encouragement over the months ahead. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, just for the saints uh, who wrote down uh, these, these praises, these laments, all that is in the Psalter, so that we can many years later benefit from them in our walk with you. Uh, we just praise you for each one of them. Uh, we pray for wisdom and understanding as we begin to read them. Uh, perhaps many will begin to start reading them today. May you bless their reading, stretch their minds and hearts to follow hard after you in a new way, and put wind in their sails as they see your great hand upon these pages. In Christ's name, amen.